Hi everyone, I'm Chef Scott. Um, I'm introducing uh, Chef George from the Ojai Valley Inn and Spa. He's gonna do some cool stuff for you guys. I hope you enjoy and um, have a good day after that. Um, the first one, we're gonna, make a, we're gonna make an appetizer. First one, we have a heirloom tomato salad. These ones are heirloom tomatoes and we have them growing at the Ojai Valley Inn and Spa in our own herb garden. And these are uh, tomatoes with a 5,000-year seed history, so they're really, really cool and very flavorful. Many times when you go in a supermarket and people who maybe don't know, they see tomatoes like that and it's like, oh, I don't want to buy them. They don't look very pretty and all that stuff. But these are actually really good, uh, flavorful, tasty tomatoes. Then we got some small ones here. These are also grape tomatoes, and they're also heirloom. Then we got some other herbs and spices, which I'm going to show you in a second. So what we would like to start... And we don't do this just for television. We're going to put on some gloves. And I believe that even though if you maybe cook at home and all that stuff, it's always good if you put your, your gloves on there and then you don't have no cross-contamination. All that stuff is good. So I got a couple of tomatoes here, which we're going to slice in relatively big chunks. So if you have six pieces of a tomato like that, and then we want to do a couple of different colors. Now, the flavor profile is kind of the same. What is different is, is the look, and I'll show you how very different they look. See? And they're all ripe, even though maybe they have different colors, but they all still have the same texture, and they kind of taste the same, except that they look different. Some small differences is maybe the uh, flavor profile. Then over here, we have some Maya lemons. Maya lemons, as you can see, these ones are pixie oranges. Maya lemons are almost like an orange from the look and from the texture of the skin and the inside, except they are a lot sweeter. So they're a little bit a, a, a mixture between a lemon, a lime, and an orange. It gives a very different and unique flavor. I'm going to squeeze a little bit in there. Unfortunately, they have about 6,000 seeds, so you want to make sure that you don't get all of them in there. Let's take a little bit of lemon juice. Then we have cold pressed extra virgin olive oil. Cracked black pepper, very simple. And a little bit of salt. And then comes the fun part. I have a little bit of honey. About a tablespoon. And what's really nice with the lemon and the pixie flavor and a little bit of mustard, we're going to make a dressing. And this dressing, what we're making here, is actually part of the salmon dressing as well. So you see, very simple. And then emulsifies. You want to make sure is that the olive oil, the honey, and all the juice is really going to mix well. You take your tomatoes. And then, we just marinate them in the dressing for a little bit. There you go. Here's one of the shortcuts I was talking about earlier. This one is a Gravlax. And what it is, it's basically, it's a line caught Pacific salmon. So it's the one which runs right outside uh, your waters out here. <laughs> And what we do it originally, gravlax means like a grave, and it comes from Scandinavia. And what happens, why is it a grave? Yesterday, exactly 24 hours ago, I made a mix out of salt and sugar, equal parts. I put juniper berries in there, dill, black pepper, a little bit of lemon juice, and Worcestershire sauce. I made that mix and put the salmon in there. And as you can see, overnight, it has basically taken out all the natural juices of the salmon. And as you all know, there's ceviche and there's, there's, there's all this kind of stuff out there where you actually marinate them with lemon and or with spices. This one is a different kind from Scandinavia, and the flavor profile comes from the dill and the salt, and it does the same thing like a ceviche, just from a different part of the world where they have used them in a different pickling way. So this salmon, even though it's not cooked, you get to taste it in a second, feels and looks cooked. It's very, very delicious, and it has changed the color because it has taken out all the natural juices. And even just to show you the back, 
See that? It's completely cooked. Now, the disadvantage you have with something like that, if you leave it in for longer than 24 hours, it becomes really salty, very, very strong. And the saltier it becomes, it better is you have a juice of the lemon or the orange or a little bit of lime and a little bit of honey because it counterfeits the, t uh, the salty taste of the salmon. So you'll see that in a second. We'll have more. Just wash this off, please. <clears throat> so we have the tomatoes marinated. You can do that, obviously, a la minute, which means we'll do it right now, right here, for your guest at home. Or for yourself, you marinate a little bit of salmon, a little bit of tomatoes, pardon me. Then over here, I have some pre-washed gem lettuce. Gem lettuce is a different kind of romaine bib lettuce. It's very small, very unique, and it has a very small, dent, um, delicate flavor. And we'll just use the hearts of it, and we'll use that as a garnish. Every time you use a lettuce or every time you use a tomato, cucumber, whatever it is, you want to give it a little bit of dressing. It's not too much. And mix it all up. Put these tomatoes away. If you have questions, just shoot. We don't need to wait till the end if you want to know something. So please go ahead. Yes? You can. You can. You don't necessarily need to do that. The challenge is when you do do that, you squeeze out the juices much faster, and it doesn't take the flavor of the actual salt and sugar mixtures. If you let it uh, do it gradually and slowly, it's on the marinade, then you get the flavor all the way through. Because if you, squ if you imagine you are, you're the salmon and you're being squished together, you have no room to breathe, even though you're dead, but it doesn't go through all the way, right? So we got the dead salmon right here. He's still all very happy, and he's all delicious right now. And I'm going to cut straight through the center. You have seen from the top, from the back. And look how beautiful it looks. Right? And it's very easy. It's very delicate. And it's very, um, should I say, very easy to slice. Let me make a little bit of space. I want to make sure you can see this. Yes. Yes, you would uh, refrigerate it, and so there's different ways of slicing it. You can slice it straight through. For our purpose, for our presentation, I like to do it like this. Or you slice it, if you want to make a nice Gravlax bagel sandwich in the morning or something, right? And you slice it like this. What is important? As you slice, not just this, as you slice anything at home, let the knife do the work. Don't let your elbows, don't let your, your arm do the work. Let the knife fl uh, flow through your product. And as you can see, if you can read the newspaper through it, you did a good job. That's how thin it's supposed to be. If it's thicker, it's not going to taste good. So the more newspaper you can read, the happier you will be. All right? So we take a little bit of salmon. Make sure there are no... See uh, no Bones in it. And again, if you don't like, or like salmon, or if you like a different kind of fish, you like halibut, you like tuna, you can do it with all these kinds of fish. You can do it the same way. A different marinade from Asia. I used to work in Japan for many years. In Asia or in Japan, they do the same like style with a salmon or with a tuna, but you would use soy sauce and ginger and garlic and chili peppers. So wherever you go around the world, the principle of a marinated fish is kind of the same, but the flavor profile is completely different. So now we have these marinated tomatoes. see, what's really nice is the contrast of the different colors. We have a couple of pieces of a little jam lettuce. And then we take a couple of, make sure all of the stuff is washed. 
We got enough protein on the plate. We don't want more protein on this. Okay, and then you see the dressing is still emulsified. Take a little bit of that. Put it over the salmon. And how fast was that? Now, if we forget about that little sucker, which is 24, days, 24 hours old, this was relatively fast, right? That was 5 minutes, 10 minutes, and you have a really cool, great-looking appetizer. It's always coming down. In the kitchen, we talk about mise en place. Mise en place is the production, which is in its place before we start. Once we have all this stuff lined up, it's going to go really fast. So what I'll do, I'll slice a few more pieces, and then more is going to give you some sample plates, and you guys can take 5 minutes or something to taste it. And then I'm going to go and start the next course. Sounds good? All right. So now is the music. Where's the music? Ah. Make me work for a living here. OK, more? You ready? Any other questions? I only look like a chef, but I'm not that mean. Oh, you see, now you had to do that. Well. <laughs> Who said that? I wasn't looking up. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm from Germany. I was born and raised in Germany, and um, I left the country when I was 22 years old to work on a cruise ship. And uh, some of your younger folks may don't know, but uh, you used to have a television show in the U.S. It was called The Love Boat, and we had the same thing in Germany, a love boat with the German love boat. And I joined that one, and it was the first time when I actually left my, uh, my village where I came from and the whole stuff. And I liked it so much, and I said, like, wow, I get to be able to see the whole world, and I get paid for it. So I left, and I never went back, only to visit. Okay, here we go. I started uh, in Germany, and then from Germany I went my first... Outside the country job was New York. And uh, you know, I've said that story before when, uh, let, me, let me start a different way. I started in Germany, I did my apprenticeship, I did my whole stuff with the love boat, and then I came to US and we had 1,500 people living in my village. So that's how small it was. And I went to a city in New York with uh, 15 million people, didn't speak a word of English, and hi, hello, that was it. That's all I could say for the first six months. And I started learning English on uh, watching Wheel of Fortune. Uh, I, I couldn't answer a single thing with what I was saying, but I was listening to the, to the letters, you know, the pronunciation, the A, B, C, and all this stuff, and eventually it started making sense. And then like you do in every language, the first thing I knew was how to cuss in New York and also how to talk bad language, especially in the kitchen, as you know. Well, maybe as you have heard. But um, so I did this, and then from New York, I went to London, worked in London for one and a half years, came back to New York and I worked in Newark and Boston, and then left the US for four years to go to work uh, in Tokyo, Japan. Worked also with a couple of stints in New Delhi, India, and in Hong Kong, Singapore. Then uh, I was tired of Asia, came back to the US, and worked in 97 with uh, Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. Was then the executive chef at the Venetian in Las Vegas, worked there for two years, and left the US again, and went to the uh, Atlantis in the Bahamas and worked there for three years, and then from Bahamas, I went back to uh, Las Vegas, worked there for seven years, had my own restaurant and catering company, and then as the whole economy went down, I went down. <laughs> I mean, the business is still alive, so that's all good, but uh, I sold the business. And then after that, I went to work for Trump International in Las Vegas, and then I went one year to the cold in Kansas City, and I didn't like that. And now I'm finally in California, where I believe I belong, where I'm the happiest. It's kind of like home where I come from in Germany, where obviously we don't have a mountain, uh, we don't have an ocean like you have over here. We got the cold North Sea, and it's really gray and not pretty, but we got the mountains and everything else. So, Sure. It's great. You have a really great eye for detail. And the reason why I said it's a Japanese knife and it's a, J a Japanese multi-utility knife. You can use it for, for seafood, for vegetables, for anything. What is different on this knife, as you can see, 
it has four different reflections almost. Each different reflection is a different kind of steel. So all of these, so this knife has four different steels and they're being pressed together. By being pressed together, they're much stronger and they're not getting as dull as quickly as regular knives. And on the top here, you'll see them, there's very, very small, you can't really see it, this is shiny, but there's a little bit more shiny in the middle. The one in the middle, all the way in the, in the center, is the sharpest, hardest steel of all four of them. But by, by having it like this, you have a really great balance when you cut with the knife and it stays sharper much longer than a traditional knife. And if you do want to sharpen it, you get it sharp much, much faster. You pull it over, over a steel like this, and if you know what you're doing, you do it this way, and if you don't, you do it this way, and there are many different ways and the whole stuff. But with a regular knife, with a regular uh, cheaper knife you can get in the supermarket, you do this two or three times, and you have small little ridges in the knife. And all of a sudden, when you cut something, it rips the meat or the, the vegetables or something like that. And when you have a really good expensive knife, you can, and I'm not doing this just to prove the point, but you can hit it really hard like that, and nothing is going to happen to it. It stays, okay? And um, I guess the appetizers are ready. Whoever is first, please help yourself. Take a picture of the appetizer, what it looks like, and then we're ready to go. You got a little bit more dressing? Don't be there. Please help yourself. We got forks. We got napkins. And then right after that, we'll start the main course. So are you hungry for more? Mm-hmm. I mean, so full mouth is a happy mouth, right? Or something like that. Okay, next one. Next one on our menu, we have a Hollywood. And again, I really believe in marinating our seafood. We got a nice, fresh piece of Hollywood. And we are going to use a pixie. A pixie orange. They only grow in Ojai. I don't know if you know that. But, and they only grow within the first part of spring. And uh, they have a slight sour orangey flavor. So we got some more lemon juice. We got this beautiful pixie flavor. And we have some cracked black pepper. And of course, salt. And what I like to use for this one is about a tablespoon of Worcestershire sauce. Just marinate it a little bit. And if you do this at home, you can put this in the refrigerator for about an hour or two and just let it rest. It's like the best thing is like seafood or meat or something. If you let it slightly come up to room temperature, when it's too cold, it takes too long for the outside temperature to get to the center. And by the time it gets to the center, the outside is overcooked. So if you have it at room temperature, it's very easy for the steak, for the meat, or whatever you want to use for e evenly the temperature to develop. We have um, just a regular pan here with some extra virgin olive oil. And under normal circumstances, meaning normal circumstances at home or in a professional kitchen, I would have a big baking oven behind me. I would take the Hollywood now and I would sear it off. Not hot yet. Um, would sear it off from all four sides because it's kind of like a square log. If it's only two sides, you take from two sides and would finish it in the oven under high temperature. The temperature, and the best is in a convection oven because the temperature flows around it keeps the outside nice, closed up. The pores can't run out, and it stays uh, juicy, right? So with this one, we're going to sear off the Hollywood. And then in the meantime, we're going to start something what's called a hollandaise. A hollandaise is a traditional butter sauce. And for this particular one, I am going to use egg yolk. I use white wine, maybe some hot water. Then we are going to use a little bit of Tabasco. Again, a tick of Worcestershire sauce. 
a lemon. And you will see that once I have seared off the halibut, I'm going to put in some fresh butter. The fresh butter, even though after it makes it crispy, it keeps it, ni keeps it nice and moist. And we're go also going to put in some fresh thyme and a little bit of fresh oregano. Why fresh thyme and oregano? Because we're having some potatoes. These potatoes are being right now, because of time constraints, they're being roasted in the oven right now. And we're going to season all of this together. So we have here the egg yolk, white wine, lemon juice, mix. And the traditional way of making a hollandaise, you make it with tarragon. But today, we don't want to do traditional. We want to use some dill. And because of the application we use, bless you, we're going to use a little bit of mustard. So it has a nice color. And now what I'll do, I'll put a piece of butter in there to let it melt. Why I don't put the butter in right away, it's going to burn before. You know? So that's why I'm going to sear off the seafood or steak or poultry, whatever you like at home, with some oil. And then you put the butter in there and it makes it nice and foamy. And then you want to take a little bit of fresh thyme. You don't need to chop the thyme. And you can hear that really nice crushing sound. See? And you put it a little bit on this side. And you are ready to flip your fish over. And again, as I was saying before, now it would be the time you put it in the oven. Let the temperature slowly seek through. Cover it up. And now work with me. Here's the oven. We put it in and done. Okay, good. All right. So clean up the oven. In the meantime, I'll put this on the side. We're going to start our sauce hollandaise. A little hot water. Hot water, you got some? Hot water, you got some? No, not in there. Just in a. <clears throat> What's important is with the Hollandaise that you don't take the egg and the egg wine and put it straight on a, on a hot uh, stove. What's going to happen, it's going to make scrambled eggs, so we want to put a little bit of water in there and make it kind of like a steam bath, and we start whipping the, the egg white like this. That's the job for apprentices in the kitchen when they just start. When you give them a, to make a hollandaise with 400 eggs and it's going to take a few hours. But at that time, they look like your old Governor Schwarzenegger or somebody like that, right? So it goes relatively fast. As soon as the water is hot, it starts, and I'll show you the different stages. You see it starts foaming. And you want to whip the base of the hollandaise up to a rose. And what I mean by a rose, I'll show you in a second. You take a wooden spoon or you take a regular spoon and you take the back of the spoon and you blow on it. Once you blow on it and it starts to look like a rose, that means it has enough cook, the egg yolk and the egg wine and the, all the flavors are emulsified enough to receive the butter. And we use clarified butter. If you would use regular butter, straight melted, it has, too many, uh, it has too much water content in it, and it will break your hollandaise. So what we do, we bring the butter to a boil, and let the water, so to speak, and the milk processes sink to the bottom of the butter. You see this, how thick this got? How fast? Right. Now what you want to do is, you want to take it down. You don't want to keep on whipping it under too much temperature, because then we're still going to end up with uh, scrambled eggs. So that's kind of good. Okay, now I'll show you what it means blowing to a rose. 
I'm not going to put that spoon back. I don't want you guys to say, oh, he's blowing my food. But, so, I don't know if you can see this. But when you blow it, it gets these ridges, and it looks like a rose. And you see it? It's sticking to the spoon. Now, if you use too much clarified butter, it will break. So what you want to do is you want to either do it by a spoon. If you're by yourself, you do a spoon at a time. And if you kind of like know what you're doing, you can pour it in and your bowl comes to alive. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very, very slow. If you do it too fast, your hollandaise will break. And when I say break, means the egg yolk and the butter won't emulsify. And it's going to look bad and taste even worse. Because you're going to have that grizzled kind of flavor. Okay, now look how cool and how fast it looks. It's kind of like the same principle as you make a mayonnaise. Except with the mayonnaise, you would have cold egg yolks, the traditional way, and you use with olive oil, a little bit of salt, pepper, lemon juice, and all that. But this one is a hot uh, sauce, which we're using for our Hollywood. Ready? And can you give me the potatoes, please? So as I was saying before, our magic oven just created some beautiful roasted potatoes. And these are... Just regular fingerling potatoes you can purchase in, in any supermarket. I just cook them, cut them in half, and then we have a herb mix, which is just, again, a little bit of thyme and oregano, as I started with in the beginning. And once they're sliced in half, after you cook them, you can keep them overnight for multiple days, and or you do like we do, which you just heat it up in the oven as you need it, and then put that in the center of your plate or however you want to make it look. Very simple. To show this. So our hollandaise is ready. It has now nicely settled. And because of the temperature difference, it got a little bit thicker. And And then what we had, we have a few regular halum beets. Now, what's special about these beets? Nothing. These are just regular beets you can buy in the supermarket. And all I did with these beets, I put them in aluminum foil, a little bit of salt, pepper, and maple syrup. So very simple, right? You take them, you put them in the foil, make a little pouch, and bake them in the oven until they're done. When they're done, you want to peel them because as, as, when they're hot, the skin comes off really easy. Again, I've done that the day before, or you can do it also the same time as you cook. You take them out, and then just in the last moment, you want to put in a little bit of fresh, fresh salt, a little bit of cracked pepper. You just give them a small little saute. And then just place them around and so you can see, the food we're cooking today is not very difficult to do, but it's very fresh, very healthy, and very colorful. Something easy you can do. Oh, we want to live super healthy, put another beat there. There you go. And that's it. That's very simple, very quickly done. And again, most of this work you can do the day before, except your hollandaise. You'll do that fresh a la minute. Okay? Now I'm going to do the same thing as we did before. We'll make you a few sample plates. The advantage from fish to seafood is you have these different layers, flakes, right? And if you're not 100% sure when a fish is done, you can touch it from the side. You don't necessarily want to touch it from the, from the top. I'll tell you in the meat, you do it from the top, and I'll tell you in a second. When you touch the seafood from the side like this, and the flakes slowly start to separate, you don't want them to completely fall apart. That means your fish is overcooked and it's really dead this time. Right? But you want to have a little bit of life in it, so you just touch it. And as you see, these small little fish membranes, so to speak, falling apart, that's the right temperature. Now, with a piece of meat, with a steak or something, you touch it from the top, because obviously it doesn't have these 
flakes and to break apart. Very simple. I show you. When you hold your hand like that, and you can all do it with me, if you hand your hold, hold your hand totally relaxed, and you press this part up below your thumb, that means the cow is still alive. Now, basically, it's rare, right? That's how the steak is rare, right? So all you need to do now is no pressure, no nothing. Just open your hand. Just open. No pressure. Touch that same area again, and you feel a little bit of a difference already. Now it's when the steak is medium rare. Now open your hand as hard as you can, really stretch it, and touch it again. Now it's medium. Now you close your hand like this and put a certain amount of pressure on it so that your fingernails slightly dig, in, dig into the center of your hand and press it again. You feel the difference now? Now it's medium well. And now you really make a fist like you want to hit something. Now it's well done. Really easy, right? So you can do it right here, and some other people, they do it here, you can do it outside. But this is the easiest way for me to do. Start from rare, all the way to well done, very easy. So this was rare, this is well done, so you just open your hand, you're medium. So you're already half there. Make sense? Kind of. Good. Okay. Let me make a... I'm, I'm in the Ohio and I'm still counting the month. I'm at 11 months, and uh, like I said before, I really like it here. I really hope this is going to work out, and uh, my job is very, very exciting because we are, our food at the Ohio is very much driven by the heart of California, so as you can see, all these fresh fruits and all these fresh vegetables and all this stuff is relatively easy to cook with. You know, many times I've worked around the world and chefs, they have food, and they create it into something else, what it's not. Why make a salmon taste like a steak if it's a salmon or whatever, you know? Many times you go into a fancy restaurant, and people want to be so creative, and it's like, oh, make, let me make a sea, sea bass with a strawberry sauce. Why? Just because you want to be creative? Just because you want to be different? No. So that's what I love being in the property I'm in now. Many of these vegetables, many of these fruits are being cooked on property. They grow in this particular area here, and we're just heating them up and just give it a little bit of additional flavor. Just make it a little bit different, a little bit of maple syrup, a little bit of honey, a little bit of uh, uh, tangerines, a little bit of jalapeno, which is all in this area and makes it very different and very unique. It gives a very fresh uh, kind of flavor. If they're good chefs, they don't really do nothing different. It's, uh, <laughs> well, it's true. Uh, and the reason why I say that, it's all, again, in the so-called mise en place. The mise en place, I'll do this now here for one or two portions, but if you do it in big cruise ships or big operations like when I work at the Atlantis or at the Venetian, we would still do the same kind of food. You just multiply it and everything is larger. So we don't have one pan. We have a pot where you can climb into and you can do 600 pieces of fish at the same time. Or we have these ovens in these big operations where I can cook 600 chicken breasts in about 15 minutes. And that's just one oven. And you have 10 all lined up next to each other. So it's a very different kind of thing, but it's still the same potato, it's still the same bead, it's still the same fish, it doesn't matter. It's all coming down to um, the preparation time, how you do it and when you do it. Please, don't be shy, help yourself. <clears throat> I have some wild strawberries here, and I'm not going to put the strawberries in the sauce. I'd like you to just taste the strawberries, and so I'm going to put them on the garnish. They taste very different, very unique. They have a little wild flavor, but they're extremely sweet. And they taste like strawberries the way they used to taste 40, 50 years ago when it wasn't so commercialized, and when you would go in a, in a field and you pick your own strawberries and all that stuff. This is really the old style, 100% organic. Really a delicious flavor, so I'd like you to taste these. These ones here, not bad strawberries, but these are the strawberries you buy in a regular supermarket. And um, what we'll do today, we're going to make spaghetti ice cream. Now it's when you're supposed to say, ooh. <laughs> All right. Okay. We're there now. Hello. All right. So I got some, I got some honey. Honey for the honey. Okay. A little bit of honey and maple syrup. And let's put some more in there. Then put 
put some powdered sugar in there. Okay. Powdered sugar is good. Sugar is good for the nerves, especially chefs. They need a lot of sugar. <laughs> they have a lot of nerves. All right, good honey. Honey is good. And some booze. Yeah, of course. Mm -mm. So this one is a magic wand, right? <coughs> Maybe some of you have it at home. If you don't have it at home, you just put it in a regular blender or you chop it up by hand or something. And um, we're just making a fresh stra strawberry sauce. Now, as I was saying before, it's all about fresh food. Fresh and simple and fast. There's no cooking involved. All natural ingredients. That's it. Very easy. Fresh strawberry sauce. So now you want to know how we do make spaghetti ice cream. <laughs> spaghetti ice cream. What do we need for spaghetti? We need a good tomato sauce. Here's our tomato sauce. Right? We need a good Parmesan cheese. Parmesan cheese. Are grated hazelnuts and walnuts. That's our Parmesan cheese. Then we need, of course, ice cream. And we need whipped cream. The world I come from, a good ice cream doesn't exist without some whipped cream. What's cool with the whipped cream? It has cinnamon and a little bit of vanilla sugar in there. And then you can buy these in every houseware store. These are potato risers. They don't cost much. They maybe cost, I don't know, $15 or something. Okay. Ooh. There come your spaghetti. <laughs> right? So you squeeze that out. And what's really cool making spaghetti ice cream like this is that even though it's still just vanilla ice cream, it's nothing special about it, that because you put it in there, it's very fluffy. It's, it tastes kind of different because of that alone. You know, you have air in it, and it's going to melt relatively fast. And now we're going to put our beautiful, delicious... Tomato sauce on there. Mm. Put a couple of chopped nuts with Parmesan cheese. And then take a few of these strawberries around it. Very simple food for home. If you want to make special, cut the green off. I leave the green on. I need roughage. I'm a chef. I need some good stuff. And that's it. Basically, very easy to do, very quickly to do. And I'm going to do the same thing for you now over there. I'll make some spaghetti ice cream. And um, you can do it any other way. You can obviously make, if you don't like strawberries, you do raspberry. Or you know, if you do it at a, at a children's party, you use blackberries. You can do all different kinds of flavors and have then the creativity of your guests or of your kids come up, what is the sauce? You know, if it's a blackberry, you make a black ink fish sauce, spaghetti, and stuff like that. It's really cool. It's a great uh, um, interaction with your kids. Strawberries, maple syrup, honey, and powdered sugar. And a little bit of that. So if the party is only for you guys, and you like to spruce it up, you put a little bit of rum in there or something else that makes you smile, and everything is good. <laughs> OK, let me make some ice cream, and you guys come forward, and we'll be done. OK, folks, that's it. I hope you had fun. And I'll see you again up the road, 6,000 miles or something like that, right? <laughs> <laughs>